In 2016, Zambians will go to the polls for the 15th time in the nation's history. That year will also mark exactly 100 years since the birth of the man who got the country high independence. He was Zambia's finest politician by a mile. One of the most political geniuses. He was a very focused person. Politically, he was a principal. He was a very considerate man. As a leader, I think he was exceptional because he was not self. He understood the damage which colonialism had done, not just to our status as, as a country, Northern Odisha, but also to the mindset of a lot of the black people. <laughs> Hurry. <laughs> Today, Kenneth Kaunda basks in the glory of the accolades for Zambia's independence, while the true hero of the independence struggle lies here, forgotten by the nation that owes him so much. I'm sure some, some younger people I'm, I'm, I would guess that 14 or 15 year olds in school would look at the newspaper and say, Who, who's that? Who is he? You know, outside southern province, you know. Little school boys, in, even in Mufalira, never mind in Dola. Who was this man? Because of the big man interpretation of politics, because of 27 years of the big man calendar, and then some big men later, some of them being very little big men. Now the original founder of the nation has, has been lost. Not, and so far as it's been remembered, it's been denigrated, in, you know, that he, the, that he f fluffed and messed up and these other people had to take over and sort things out, you know. They, they have become the writers of history or the interpreters of, of history. So, what is the truth about Zambia's independence struggle and Nkumbula's role in it? He was the one who set us off on the road to independence. He conceptualized it, he imagined it, he thought it and he saw it and he gathered other men around him to, to help him do it. What he was doing, he was not doing it for himself. He calculated it so well that, um, you know, Zambia was more important to, you know, to him. And the African people, the Zambians, they needed change. They needed to be independent. They, need, they needed to govern themselves. And because of that, um, he decided to do what he did, because that was his interest. His interest was not even to become the president of Zambia. You know, for him, his interest was to liberate the people of Zambia. So, for that one, I loved him more. Smart person. He never wore a Chinese suit. He said, those are counter sparrows and so on. He was in the British head in suits every day. I knew Mr. Harry Mwanga Nkumbula uh, in Livingston in the very early 50s. Uh, since my father was involved with civil service politics as president of the Northern Odisha African Civil Servants Association, uh, Mr. Nkumbula and him were very close friends. And Mr. Nkumbula used to visit our house uh, to have discussions with the my dad about what was happening in the liberation struggle at the time. And as a boy, I would sit on the veranda of the house where they sat to listen to some of the conversations which they, which they used to have. He was always uh, talking about the need for the people of Northern Odisha, as it was then called, to govern themselves. And that uh, it was important that people got an education because we have to prepare the people of Northern Odisha to take over 
responsibility for their own countries at some point. And he was also talking about improvements of the conditions of service for Africans, not just in the mining industry, but also in the civil service and in other uh, areas, including domestic servants. I first met uh, Harry when I was a teenager. I was going to school at uh, Kitwe Men's School in Kitwe, and he had come to uh, address an African National Congress meeting. That was in 1952, uh, one year after he had taken over as a president of the African National Congress. Oh, it, it was a marvelous experience. He was larger than life. As president of the African National Congress, of course, one expected uh, him to carry that kind of uh, aura. <laughs> but if he really was that big, how come the country knows so little about him? To answer that one, we had to take a drive back into the annals of history. It turned out to be an exhilarating journey, back to a time when black men were the white man's horses, and the national soccer team looked not so black. Back to a time when Zambia went by the name Northern Rhodesia. But what the majority of Zambians do not know is that there is one year in the nation's history that was probably more important even than 1964. The year that made 1964 possible. 1962. Northern Rhodesia. Governor Arthur Benson has introduced a constitution that grants Africans suffrage for the first time. The idea of that constitution was to increase the African participation in the legislative uh, uh, council. A total of 45 seats are up for grabs. These have been divided into what came to be popularly referred to as 15-15-15, meaning the 45 constituencies have been divided into three roles. There were three uh, uh, elections, actually, in one election. The upper role uh, elections, the lower role elections, and the national elections. The upper row seats were reserved exclusively for white candidates, and the lower row seats were reserved exclusively for Africans. The third row, known as the national row, is open to both Africans and whites. But the national row has a special condition attached to it. Uh, the constitution said that um, whoever is going to win must have at least 20% from the one race and 10% from the other race. There are national seats, about 15 national seats. For you to win any of those national seats, your candidate must get 10% of the votes from the other race. So no matter how many votes he got, if he didn't get 10% of the European vote, he could not have qualified to go to the Legislative Council. The system was designed to ensure that, no matter what, the whites got equal representation in the LegCo. Four political parties are contesting the elections. The United Federal Party, led by John Roberts. The Liberal Party, led by John Moffat. The United National Independence Party, led by Kenneth Kaunda. And the African National Congress, led by Harry Mangangumbla. If one of the two African parties wins the elections, the nation gains its independence. Otherwise, colonial rule continues. Before the elections uh, in October, uh, Mr. Nkumbula came to a, a working arrangement uh, with uh, John Roberts of the United Federal Party that the two parties would cooperate. Um, in supporting each other uh, for the uh, national constituencies. And uh, that brought uh, uh, Harry and a lot of criticism. Uh, UNIP uh, uh, called him a shellout, <laughs> a traitor, uh, that kind of thing. But uh, that arrangement made it possible uh, for Nkumbula to secure uh, seats on the National Register. For any party to form government, 
it needs to win a minimum of 21 seats out of the 45 in the Legislative Council. But when the vote count is over, there is no outright winner. The United Federal Party has won every single seat in the upper row, plus one in the national row, giving it a total of 16. UNIP, Kaunda's party, has won 14 in the lower row. Nkumbla's party has seven seats, one in the lower row and six in the national row. The country faces a constitutional crisis. It is a nation without an elected government. The solution? A coalition government. Suddenly, Kumbla finds himself being courted by the UFP and UNIP. But which two parties? A coalition between UFP and either African party means no independence. And UNIP has made enemies of the United Federal Party and there are rivers of bad blood flowing in the streets all over the country between the ANC and UNIP. Before that, UNIP had pulled all the stops on their efforts to obliterate Nkumbla and his party. The two African parties hated each other more than they hated the whites. So everybody was looking for Harry Nkumbula to form a coalition government. I remember sitting with him there. I was sent by President Kenneth Kaunda to go and talk to him about the first African coalition government. The stage was set for a three-way courtship and everything hinged on Harry Mwanga Nkumbula. Whose bed does he get into? Roberts or Kaunda?